Plain, we can get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Blaine Ruschak. I'm the president of the KPMG US Foundation and the president of the PhD Project. I'm very excited that you're able to join us this, this afternoon. Um, as we um, approach examining diversity in the C-suite and the boardroom. This is the fourth in our series of webinars um, focusing on the state of equity, inclusion, and diversity in business. A little bit about the PhD project since we are co-sponsor of today's event. Um, we started in 1994 um, and the premise was that, you know, if we increase diversity in the classroom, it would lead to an increase in diversity of students in the classroom, which would lead to an increase in um, opportunities and candidates in corporate America. And over that 26 year period, we have been able to increase the number of diverse faculty from under 300 when we first started out to over 1300 active right now and 300 um, students in the pipeline. Um, so we are making a difference in many ways. Um, we're really excited today that we have one of our PhD project um, faculty alum, Dr. Stephanie Creary, joining us today from uh, University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business. Um, we also have um, John Rogers from Ariel Investments, who is the co-CEO and chair. And we have Paul Knopp from KPMG, who is our chair and CEO. Um, and what a great opportunity to have two CEOs and uh, a, a amazing you know, uh, faculty member, Dr. Creary. So um, we know we're gonna have a great session in store. Um, one of the things that I would point out that the PhD project has done to try to address you know, this, um, you know, the, the CEO and boardroom is offer a, a board fit program for our, PhD, our senior PhD project members to go to training um, and become you know, ready to, to activate and be on boards um, and you know, corporations and large nonprofits. Um, over 26 members um, at this point have gone through the program and we hope to have more growth of the program this year. If you're thinking of getting a PhD, so if you're on this call thinking, wow, this PhD project sounds pretty cool and I might wanna get one, um, please go to our, our phdproject.org site. Um, you can find out about our November conference and how you can get engaged and come learn about getting a PhD. Um, or if you're a corporation and you really like what you hear about uh, today's event and the PhD project sounds like something you'd like to learn more about and potentially become a sponsor, please go to our website and learn more about it from our website. Um, and with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our amazing facilitator, moderator, Sasha Thompson, the founder of the Equity Equation. Sasha, take it away. Thank you, Blaine. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Sasha Thompson. I'm the founder of the Equity Equation, which is a diversity coaching and consulting business in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, where we focus on creating equitable and inclusive workplaces. So I am very excited to have this conversation because this is my sweet spot. This is you know bringing academia and the corporate space together, specifically talking about advancing diversity work. And so we have three phenomenal panelists with us tonight. The first is John Rogers who is the chairman, co-CEO, and chief investment officer at Ariel Investments. In 1983, John founded Ariel to focus on patient value investing with, I'm sorry, within small and medium-sized companies. Early in his career, John's investment acumen brought him to the forefront of media attention and culminated in him being selected as co-mutual fund manager of the year by Sylvia Porter's personal finance magazine, as well as an all-star mutual fund manager by USA Today. Furthermore, John has been highlighted alongside legendary investors, Warren Buffett, Sir John Templeton, and Ben Graham in the distinguished book, The World's 99 Greatest Investors. His professional accomplishments extend to the boardroom where he is a member of the board of directors of McDonald's, Nike, and the New York Times Company. John also serves as chair, vice chair of the board of trustees of the University of Chicago. Additionally, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a director of the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights. In 2008, John was awarded Princeton University's highest honor, the Woodrow Wilson Award, presented each year to the alumnus or alumna whose career embodies a commitment to national service. Following the election of President Barack Obama, John served as co-chair for the Presidential Inaugural Committee in 2009, 
and was recent, most recently joined the Barack Obama Foundation's Board of Directors. John received an AB in economics, I'm sorry, for a BA in economics from Princeton University, where he was also captain of the varsity basketball team. Welcome, John. Next, we have Professor Stephanie Creary. Stephanie is an identity and diversity scholar and a field researcher. She is also a founding faculty member of the Wharton Ideas Lab, Identity, Diversity, Engagement, Effect, and Social Relationships, and an affiliated faculty member of Wharton People Analytics, a senior fellow of the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics, and affiliated faculty member of the Penn Center for Africana Studies. She leads the leading diversity at Wharton's speaker series as part of her Lead Diversity on Organizations course at Wharton and host the Knowledge at Wharton Leading Diversity at Work podcast series. As an organizational scholar, Professor Curry studies people's identities at work, including their professional identities, marginalized identities, and the resources their organizations provide to support their identities. Prior to joining Wharton faculty, Professor Curry was on the faculty of Cornell University. Prior to completing her PhD, she was a research associate at Harvard Business School and the conference board of NYC researching corporate diversity and inclusion practices. She also has extensive work experience in the healthcare industry. Professor Curry has earned a BS and MS degree from Boston University Sargent College of Health and Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation Sciences, an MBA degree from Simmons School, Simon School of Management and MS and PhDs from the Boston College Carroll School of Management. Whew. Welcome, Stephanie. And our final um, panelist, last but not least, Paul Knob, is Chair and C Chief Executive Officer at KPMG LLP, one of the world's largest, I'm sorry, one of the world's leading professional services firms. He also serves as chair of the Americas region and is a member of both KPMG's global board and executive committee, leading more than 32,000 partners and professionals across the United States. Paul is further strengthening KPMG's inclusive and values-driven culture. He has extensive experience serving large multinational clients in a wide variety of complex industries and is recognized for his commitment to excellence and quality and for leading KPMG teams with integrity, and ethics. Prior to becoming chair and CEO, Paul's career as an audit partner focused on serving leading global, com leading global companies in the manufacturing, life sciences, transportation, professional services, and technology industries. He served as the global lead audit engagement manager and engagement quality control review partner for KPMG's audits of numerous Fortune 500 companies. Additionally, he lends his time and expertise to many civic and charitable organizations. He is the governing board member of the Center for Audit Quality, as well as a board member of Catalyst, Chief Executives of Corporate Purpose, Partnership on New York, Partnership for New York City, and the US India Business Council. Paul previously served as Director and Vice Chairman of the American Cancer Society Chicago Downtown Division's Board of Directors. He holds a BBA and MBA degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, is a licensed CPA in New York and Texas, and is a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Welcome, Paul. All right, so I am excited to jump dive right into this conversation. Um, and so just kind of to, to provide a, a foundation for this discussion, um, <clears throat> the racial unrest of last summer Kind of brought some changes we had not seen in corporate America. And thousands of companies released statements around um, supporting racial um, injustice reform and following those statements with pledges to increase the numbers of Blacks in their executive ranks and on their boards. But many have questions if this is just a performative tactic or if it's a means, it truly a means to systemic change. So Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. And what are you seeing in your research? So let me first begin by saying thank you so much, Sasha, for moderating today's conversation and for the PhD project for sponsoring today's event. 
I want to uh, give a shout out to the PhD project, which I've been involved with since 2007, when I attended my first PhD project conference in, in 2000, when I, 2007, when I wasn't truly convinced that I wanted to go back to school yet again for a PhD. But the amazing um, insights that were delivered at that conference uh, told me that this would be the right move for me. And then I started my PhD at the Boston College uh, Carroll School of Management in 2009. And so it, it's been quite the journey. Uh, I will tell you that one of the things that motivated me and truly motivated me to actually uh, embarking on this journey of academia was that I was really interested in understanding um, at a both a granular level and an abstract level what corporate leaders and corporate organizations were doing with respect to managing diversity, equity, inclusion. So this is a question I've been chasing for about 15 years. So it goes without saying after the uh, murder of George Floyd and many others, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery among a few, this summer when corporate leaders started uh, suggesting that they wanted uh, things to change and they wanted to be at the forefront of ending systemic racism, uh, you know, my eyes and my ears perked up. Um, I will say, yes, there has been a lot of criticism that these initiatives are performative. And for some corporate organizations, they are. And I do have data to back this up. And when I suggest performative, what I'm saying is that there were a lot of statements about what we intend to do. And some companies have not followed up, right? And so that's what we call a performative tactic. However, there are a whole host, and I have data to suggest, there are a whole host of companies that not only uh, initially announcing their, their intentions in the first week of June, uh, they also followed up with secondary statements in around August or September, a very public um, uh, statements dedicating themselves to a variety of initiatives. Yes, a lot of it is philanthropy, which, which is great, but uh, a lot of it is actually real engagement with communities, with uh, various institutions, with legislation and policymakers. I also want to suggest that, um, you know, for some companies, uh, what has been really challenging is that uh, the topic of race and racism has been one that they've shied away from and in fact ran away from for a very long time. As I mentioned, I started doing this work in about 2007. And in 2007, as many of these leaders who have put out statements today, um, we're embarking on what they called globalizing their diversity initiative. And, and so that means taking this diversity, uh, corporate diversity set of practices that seemed very North American centric as they were trying to figure out how to make this relevant outside of the United States. My data suggests that there was an intentional downplaying of race as a dimension of diversity that was meaningful around the world and uh, an amplification of gender as a dimension of diversity that was universally meaningful. And so again, fast forwarding to 2020, as we're seeing all of this energy around race um, and racism, I contend that for so many of these companies, they are having to um, wrestle with this idea that this was something that they intentionally did thought was not meaningful um, in the global context. And now it's something that they're suggesting there is. So there's lots of room, I would say, for criticism, but there's also lots of evidence to suggest that there are some better companies that are actually sticking to their commitments and really trying to find their way. Thank you. Wow, well, there's a lot to unpack that we're gonna get back <laughs> to in a second on that one. Paul, you know, KPMG has been in this space for some time. Um, so this is not new. Why do you think organizations are now just getting on board? Stephanie talked about it a little bit just now, but from your perspective, you know, why, why the change now? Sasha, let me thank you, first of all, for having us here today. And we're so proud to be associated with the PhD project. And I, I think that the answer to your question really lies in recognizing the strategic imperative around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of momentum around what we call ESG, environmental, social, and governance mm -hmm. for a number of years now. But when the pandemic started and when George Floyd was killed, there was just a, a, a huge moment of pivoting and focusing not just on the E and ESG, but the S and the G and how the S and the G interact. So, you know, the, the, the most important element of that S in my view is diversity, equity, inclusion, and how you drive that in your organization. And I think, you know, that stakeholders are scrutinizing large organizations and organizations of all type to ensure that they really are going to change through the, the ESG lens. 
So, you know, we, we at KPMG did a survey recently of CEOs and 96% said that scrutiny of their organization's diversity performance will continue to increase over the next several years. And I think they're recognizing that. But having said that, you know, to really be successful, organizations really gonna, are going to have to appreciate and understand the real value of diversity, equity, and inclusion, including in the boardroom, and the value of diverse thinking in the boardroom. So while the scrutiny is there, and while the pandemic and the, the calls for societal change around the social justice issues are very prevalent, we as organizations really have to focus on recognizing, appreciating, and driving the view and the understanding that diversity brings better performance in the boardroom and in our organizations. Thank you. John. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a different angle with you. Um, you come from a family that has a long history of speaking out um, against injustice and speaking up for inclusion. And so you've also been in the C-suite and on several boards. So this isn't new. Like this is not something that just started. And again, KPMG has been doing this for a while too. So why do you think it's important that this peaked interest, why is it that this peak interest is so important right now? I think the reason it's so important right now is because the data has been made more and more clear that the wealth divide between the African American community and the white community is growing larger and larger. You know, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis has data that shows between 1992 and 2016, college educated blacks saw their wealth decline 10% and college educated whites saw their wealth increase 96% during that roughly 25 year period. So we are going backwards dramatically. You know, the dean at Yale's business school, Kerwin Charles, has all this data that shows that we are relative to white Americans, we are worse off than our grandparents were. And this wealth divide has just been spiraling downward since 1970. And it's something that people have just not understood. If we don't make an impact on this wealth divide and create equal economic opportunity for African Americans, we will, you know, we will continue to plummet and uh, the lack of opportunity is directly tied to the lack of healthcare in our community, the lack of great education, the lack of housing, the impact of us being involved in the criminal justice department is all directly correlated to wealth. Mm -hmm. And we don't wanna just spiral in becoming an insignificant race in this country. We all have to stand up and create equal economic opportunity for African-Americans today. Uh, we can't wait for tomorrow. Thank you. You know, and as I'm listening to you, um, you know, what's playing in my head or what I'm, I'm thinking about is we know that this is important, um, but we also often hear like, oh, well, there's a pipeline issue, right? And there's this fear that if you increase diversity, then someone's missing out, right? It's a zero sum game. Um, how do we address those concerns? And so Paul, I'll kind of throw that to you first. Sasha, it's a great question. You know, I think part of the issue is how you define and imagine the, what the pipeline is. And we, we have to be more intentional and more inclusive about the efforts around finding the candidates to be in the boardroom that are diverse and inclusive. And, you know, part, part of that is we have to have more intentionality in ensuring underrepresented groups get the opportunity for service in the boardroom because there is ample talent when it comes to uh, diverse uh, individuals in our society. So, you know, any leadership group really has a risk of replicating themselves. And, you have, and that could be true of boards, it could be true of management teams, it could be because of intentional or unintentional or unconscious bias. And, you know, for, you know, one example would be a, a board that's seeking only a Fortune 500 CEO. Did Paul freeze for you all? Yo, your lens, you're likely to that have phenomenal skills, you know, that have strategic backgrounds and experience that might fit very well in that same boardroom without having been a Fortune 500 CEO. So I think, you know, we need to recognize that DEI is a strategic imperative. It helps improve results. And while somebody might think they're losing out, really at the end of the day, it's more about providing the opportunities 
and about improving business performance. And I think we just have to have a different view of what that pipeline really is. And Paul, you cut out for a little bit. So I wanna make sure that everyone caught what you said. Um, so from what I understood, you were saying that people are, if they're looking for a Fortune 500 CEO, then the pool, the diverse pool is very limited. And so looking at other roles. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I cut out. I apologize. Yep, no, that's okay. No, that, that, that is right. So it's, it's about what is that pipeline and, and how is that pipeline defined? And are we defining it too narrowly? There, there is you know, ample diverse talent in the market. We just need to be more intentional about thinking about who can add value in the boardroom. Got it. Thank you so much. And John, I'll ask, throw that question to you as well, too. Um, you know, is it a, is there a pipeline problem or how do we get rid of that, that thought? I, I think that the pipeline problem is a part of it. Sure, we need to have a grander, more important pipeline. And we've been working on at that at Ariel. Um, but at the same time, it is a huge demand problem. As Paul knows, being in professional services and financial services, one of the ways you become successful, becoming a managing director or a partner or senior partner, get on the management committee, be in leadership roles, is your ability to generate revenue and to bring in customers. And as we know, because of the historic discrimination and Jim Crow laws that we lived through, the segregation that we lived through in most major cities, we didn't get the opportunity to build the social networks that ultimately lead to business opportunities. We often didn't grow up in communities where our friends, parents, or nieces or nephews were CFOs and general counsels and leadership people who can bring business to you as you develop your business career. So what you have to do to overcome that is get progressive institutions to lead the way Harold Washington led when he was the mayor of Chicago or Maynard Jackson when he was the mayor of Atlanta. When they said, if you're gonna do business in our cities, you're gonna to have to have teams that look like our city. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, if you go back to when a lot of uh, the African-American leadership in the financial service industry got started, it was a, during a period in the early 80s when progressive mayors throughout the country insisted that their investment bankers look like their cities. And all of a sudden, the Ray McGuire's were popping up and the Jim Reynolds and the Chris Williams, all of us are of the same generation. I was the first African-American to work at William Blair and Company in Chicago. But it was that political pressure that forced financial institutions to demand that the, the African Americans have a fa fair shot. And sure enough, when the demand went up, all of a sudden, uh, people found these talented individuals who have become managing directors, have started their own firms, have been tremendously successful. So I just think it's so critical to have demand and supply, and you can't, you won't make progress unless you do both. So it almost seems as if what's happening right now, that pressure is kind of circling back, right? And so. Yeah, it's, it's a good example. You know, there's much more demand now. And there's been some great corporate actors who've done this well. You know, Exelon Corporation probably is one of the best in the country at insisting that all their professional services providers have minority uh, partners and lead executives on the relationship with Exelon from investment banking to legal, to accounting, to consulting, to everything they do, and they honor those people. The University of Chicago does an extraordinary job of that. So when you have you know, that happening, you're hoping that's gonna be a role model for the rest of the nation to uh, push that agenda. And all those institutions also start stop doing business with firms that don't look the way they should look and are not creating those kind of leadership opportunities. So I just think that we won't make progress unless you have people holding these institutions accountable on the lack of diversity on their team. And that's what's happening today throughout the United States. You're seeing even nonprofits now for the first time, people who have foundations are going to their money managers to manage the foundations and say, it's, un it's inexcusable that your private equity firm has never had a black partner in its history, never had a black senior executive. And the companies that you're buying and taking private uh, and then going public again, have never had any you know, black executives or blacks on their boards. So the timing is right. And when these all of a sudden, as all the major universities and hospitals and museums and foundations demand this, I guarantee the supply of talent will show up. And this is what's gonna that's what's starting to happen today. And final, final point, I'm sorry to go on long about this, but the political pressure is really helping a lot. 
you know, uh, Congressman Kennedy and, and Congressman Cleaver in DC sent letters to the top endowments in the United States. Reverend Sharpton has engaged with many of the student newspapers on campus to let them know that from, from, from Penn to Dartmouth uh, to Princeton, that there's so little diversity involved in, in their endowment and the wealth that's created there. So this political pressure is making a difference. The civil rights pressure is starting to make a difference. Progressive Congress leaders, Congress leadership like uh, Maxine Waters and Joyce Beatty are really moving the needle. Mm -hmm. So, and they're having more power because of this current environment we're living in that was caused by George Floyd's death and the other murders that we experienced in this last several years. Thank you. And Stephanie, I'm gonna turn to you and I'm gonna combine this with a question that came in the, the chat um, or the Q and A. So, you know, what is your research telling you about the, the room at the top and adding to that and kind of tying into what John was saying just now, um, there are folks in the pipeline, right? So, so what is that last little piece that your research is saying needs to happen? Yeah, so I'm thinking so many things right now because I, I frankly am, am, am pretty tired of the pipeline conversation as, as, as many of us are. And I think I, it, when I'm tired of it, it means that people who've been doing this much longer than I am are really exhausted. And, and the issue is, is, I think as we think about the pipeline, sometimes people think of that as an objective thing, right? Something that exists that's out there that it is what it is. And so there's nothing that we can do about it. But remember, the pipeline is constructed. The fact that we might have fewer black people in positions of leadership is because somebody did something or didn't do enough to ensure that there were black people coming through the pipeline or Hispanic Latino people, right? So this there's a pipeline problem sometimes uh, passes the blame elsewhere um, in, in society when really it's up to people who are making decisions to make sure that they're pushing people through. So that's why I get tired of the pipeline conversation because it, it really is a passing the buck. We can't advance people because there aren't enough of any. That's usually how that conversation goes. The next part of what um, I think is really important is what's behind the pipeline, we can't find any, is, is, is not understanding or not, I, I would say, acknowledging or being explicit about the fact that we as leaders create the criteria that we believe are important for uh, advancing someone into leadership. And Paul talked about this. Do you actually need a CEO of a Fortune 500 company on your board? And if so, why? These criteria are subjective. I have research studies that I conduct um, interviews with people who are on boards, black and white board directors. And I will tell you, it is not unanimous, nor is it a majority opinion that you actually need a Fortune 500 CEO on the board of a company. So why has that been a criterion for so long? Well, it's because people decide we know based on science, right? People make decisions based on what they're comfortable with. So if I'm a Fortune 500 CEO and I'm running a company, then I'm going to assume that anybody else who has the same characteristics and background that I have is um, going to be just as good as I am, right? Now, that's not always the case, but that's how decisions are made. Um, and so it seems risky is the word that people often use if we were to choose somebody who comes from a different persuasion. Now back to the conversation around the pipeline issue. Is there really a pipeline issue to the extent that we think there is, or do we have boards that are failing to acknowledge and appreciate the other sets of, of, of skills, of aptitudes, of experiences that are important for a board to be effective, to effectively lead the organization? And that's really part of the problem. That's the, one might call it unconscious, I'll also call it conscious biases that exist that are very real that prevent lots of people from being able to be put in positions um, of, of authority and leadership. The last thing, because I am an academic, I am going to acknowledge um, the power uh, conversation here, is understand at a fundamental level, we are talking about people um, and their experience of power and feeling powerless. So if I am told that I might potentially lose power and authority by having other people join the party, then I might feel threatened and I might not want anybody else there. And that's a very real dynamic that shouldn't go underappreciated as we're talking about this. Now, interestingly enough, so we have many people on the call today who are also from academia. One of the things that is, is a fundamental aspect of negotiation theory is that whenever there is this idea of like a zero sum uh, negotiation, which is, uh, you know, the, the idea of a fixed pie mindset, right? 
Um, do you, uh, is, is, there a, is there the capacity to actually expand the pie? And in, in all actuality, certainly a few years ago, as we saw the mandate going into effect in, in California around increasing gender diversity on board, we saw many boards take that mindset where they actually added seats to the board um, and they made room to uh, recruit more people onto the board. Now there's a there's a reality uh, of you can't have the board be, only, you can only be only so big before it doesn't become so effective, but there's this expand the pie mindset that's always available to leaders. Um, but not every board is taking that position. The last thing, and I think we should rem all remember as, as a great example of this, it is rare in practice, is um, Al Alexis Ohanian who was a former, who's the co-founder of Reddit and formerly a part of the board, where mm -hmm. as all of this was happening last summer, it was very explicit in saying, I'm stepping off the board so that someone who is black can take my seat. And that is what happened is, is Alexis Ohanian gave up his board seat and it was replaced with Michael, I believe the name is pronounced Seibel or Siebel, who's a black tech executive. Um, and so that's this notion of maybe we can't increase the board size, but I'm willing to give up my power to share it with you. So, so we do have to remember that beyond what we think is rational, right? This idea that qualifications and pipeline issues are emotional reactions to not feeling as if they, if someone can still have the same opportunities um, if they have to share. So I do think we have to remember the emotional side of organizations, which is oftentimes what I study, and not that it's always about true, hard, objective qualifications and people's pipeline issues. So I want to pivot a little bit, and Stephanie, you talked about this, um, about the work that you and John are doing, right, around being, on, you know, people of color on boards and, and the work that needs to be done. Um, how can people being asked to serve in these positions have impact, right? So not just sit on the board, but what do they need to do in order to really have impact and drive change? So John, I will start with you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, we have a conference every year for African-Americans and, and Latinx directors. We've done it now in 17 years. I'm Charles Trivet from Russell Reynolds is our partner. And it's been from the very beginning and it's been very successful. We had the last time before COVID, we had 200 directors come. And one of the highlights every year, before, beside the fact that we have usually seven, eight CEOs at every, every uh, conference and you know, great leaders of all colors there, Friday night, we always had the conscience of the conference to remind directors they have a responsibility to speak up and speak out around economic justice once you're in the boardroom. And we've had everyone from, you know, Dr. King's best friend, Harry Belafonte, you know, the great civil rights leader and, you know, entertainer and to uh, Reverend Sharpton and, and Reverend Jackson and Sherilyn Ifill. And you go down the list, President Obama, uh, Eric Holder, just these great, great leaders, iconic leaders. You know, I shouldn't go on too long about them, but, you know, just people like Andy Young and others who were there fighting with Dr. King. And of course, the late John Lewis, who remind us we're in leadership roles, we have a responsibility when we see things that are not right or not just, we need to speak out and make good trouble. And so that has been the inspiration of our conference. We want people to feel comfortable doing that. And we came up with three Ps to directly answer your question. We want you in the boardroom, and we all agree to do this, is to track number one philanthropy, to make sure that philanthropic dollars are just not going to the local hospital or university or cultural institution but are going to civil rights organizations and community-based organizations that are fighting for social and economic justice. The second P is people, you know, keeping track of not only the broad diversity of the organization, but looking at African-American and Latinx executives in the C-suite, on the management committees, in these leadership roles that really matter, because we believe if you get leaders of color in those top roles, they'll be pied pipers of talent and help bring in more talent, keep the talent in place that's already there. And then third is purchasing and asking all corporate America to keep track of their spending by category. Because again, as Paul knows, and, and I've talked to Stephanie a lot about this, our community, our society has become a professional services and financial services and technology-based economy. And the old fashioned supplier diversity nomenclature is literally 40 years out of date. You know, it's, it's a modern day Jim Crow of the black and brown people only get the opportunities to do catering and construction, which are important fields. And the white guys get to do private equity, hedge funds, consulting, venture capital, what have you. 
And so if you keep track by category and are transparent about it, you'll start to see these discrepancies, this unfairness. And we think that's a critical thing and use the terminology that we use at the University of Chicago, get rid of supplier diversity and make it business diverse to signal that you're open for business and everything that where money is being spent. So those three Ps are really, really powerful and important. And we already talked about keeping track of the executives on all the majority firms that work with the institutions that you're on the board of. Now, you just touched on something we spoke about in our last um, or in another past panel of this work, not just being about HR, right? It is about the business. It's about creating, making sure it's part of the DNA of the organization and you're seeing it in every place. So I'm excited to hear you talk about, you know, no longer talk about some supplier diversity, but it is business diversity. Exactly. And I would just add, you know, you know, Dr. King, you know, late in his life kept talking about the importance of economic justice. He said, well-meaning, you know, white Americans deplore prejudice, but accept or ignore economic injustice. He understood that he talked about the fact that once you got the lunchroom open and people could come and sit in the lunchroom at a restaurant, you needed to be able to have the money to buy the hamburger once you got there. He tied those things together and he understood that. So we have to keep reminding us, if you build strong black businesses, we will employ each other, we'll be role models to each other, we'll create philanthropy from our own communities for our churches and all the things that go on in local communities. And it becomes this beautiful you know, opportunity for wealth to be created once you have a strong black business community. And it can actually help with the pipeline. I use the example that, you know, the two top African-Americans in Northern Trust Bank, the first two ever on the management committee, started their careers at Ariel as summer interns. Mm -hmm. So strong black business community really makes a difference for achieving all the goals we have. But too often we've gotten away from asking those tough questions and just get comfortable giving the contracts and opportunity to the traditional white firms that have always gotten it generation after generation after generation. Thank you. Stephanie, yeah. I want to... I want to continue with that, but I also, I'm looking at the questions and there's, I want to add a piece to it. I keep adding to your stuff. I'm sorry, but um, I want to um, also understand not just what these boards need to do while they're there or the people on the boards doing, but what can also ensure their success. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, what I what I actually want to share with the audience because we haven't shared this yet is um, that John and I have been working together on this topic um, since about last summer and, and what happened was um, I'd been conducting research on boards for some time, starting with the California um, uh, legislation around mandating gender greater gender diversity. And interestingly enough, um, as I was talking about interviewing people who are board members about issues of diversity on boards, John's name came up quite frequently as somebody who is a standout executive and board director who truly does champion issues of diversity. Now, I'd heard of John for a long time. He's a very prominent, accomplished, I don't want to embarrass him, executive uh, in, in corporate America. So clearly I knew who he was, um, but I had never had the chance to meet him. And so last summer, I got the opportunity, I got an invitation to be on a panel uh, for a professional association. And the carrot that they dangled in front of me, because I didn't feel like being on any more panels, was John Rogers is going to be on this panel. So I decided only to be part of this panel because I thought I would be able to meet John Rogers. And it was great. So I say from there is, you know, by meeting John, I've heard a lot about, you know, through actually people who he probably knows, but he doesn't know they told me this. I've heard a lot about the Black Directors Conference. I've heard a lot about the three Ps. And I've become very interested in understanding the difference between leaders like John, who take this as one of their major uh, reasons for being on a board, uh, issues of diversity and racial justice, and push them forward, and directors who don't. Um, and so John and I've had a lot of conversations about this. It's embedded. We wrote an uh, article for strategy and business. It's how board directors can advance racial justice. So we talk about this there. But in my research, my academic research that's following on from this, where I've also now interviewed a subset of Black board directors, I've learned a lot about the fact that um, there are differences among people who are on boards. Yes, white directors versus black directors versus male directors versus female and everybody um, around those categories are not within them is not everybody feels 
first of all, confident that taking on issues of diversity is the board's role. That's the first issue. The second is, is even if people do feel that talking about diversity is part of the board's role, it might be limited to diversifying the board, getting another black director, getting a female. Um, and it might not be have been prior to 2020, even about race. Um, so now what's interesting as I've been interviewing black board directors is I've been learning that this feels like a massive window um, where now there's a lot of energy around talking about issues of racial justice and equity and more and more board uh, directors are actually seeing it as their job. So while John for years has been co-leading this black board directors and has been talking about the three P's and these black board directors I talked to mentioned the three P's, there just hasn't been, from my perspective as a scholar, um, so many uh, board directors who've taken up the charge. And it does seem that there is a sense of energy now around that. So uh, to answer part of your question, I do think it's about um, personal accountability and responsibility, which is what John and I talk about in the article. I do think it's also about what I would call pressure, but what organizations like State Street Global Advisors call guidance, right? So this guidance that I call pressure is coming from the investor community is we believe board diversity is important and we believe that diversity is important broadly for firms and we believe that it is a risk to the firm if you don't effectively uh, take diversity seriously. So I do believe that there are two inputs here, myself as a board director being personally accountable to all of this and also the investor community is now pushing this issue in a, in a guided sort of way. Thank you. Paul, get your voice back in here because there's lots that I'm thinking about and I'm also looking at the, um, the chat as well and the, the Q&A. And so um, you, we talked about it, Blaine talked about it a little bit um, in the intro about board fit, right? And so we've brushed against a little um, conversation around networking and having opportunities for access. But can you talk to us about KPMG's board fit and why that and how that's changed or changing the board landscape? Yeah, Sasha, KPMG has board fit, which is part of our KPMG board leadership center. And the, the goal is to help senior executives that aren't currently on boards prepare for and signal that they are ready for board service. So, you know, we conduct board fit programs with several board affinity groups like Latino corporate directors, African-American directors forum, Pinnacle, which is Pan-Asian forum. LGBTQ, uh, women's corporate directors, the Hispanic IT executives, and the, and the PhD project. So, you know, what we're trying to do is make diverse candidates more ready for the boardroom, recognizing, and I know that we don't, we don't love that term pipeline, but we, we're trying to ensure that everyone knows that that pipeline is full of rich and robust candidates. And, you know, the more that we can do to prepare diverse candidates for the boardroom, the, the better we're able to uh, prepare the boardroom to accept diverse candidates. So diversity really begins with education and board fit is just one way that we're taking action. And I would say too that um, we, we also work with uh, organizations like the Latino Corporate Directors Association to publish certain reports and measures to help measure representation on Fortune 1000 companies. We're doing the same thing with the Pan, uh, with Pan Asian Americans and African American groups. And, you know, we found that the uh, Latino Corporate Directors Association showed that only 3% of board seats were held by Latinos, mm -hmm. uh, despite the fact that there were 20% Latinos in the population. And we're delighted to report that we've made really great progress working with that organization. Uh, LCDA has recently announced the number of Latinos appointed to boards in the first quarter of 2021 almost quadrupled compared to the first quarter of the prior year. So 82 versus 19 and 40% of those are 33 uh, individuals are first time board members. So there's so much more that we can do if we just lead and provide opportunities for more diverse candidates. So I know this is not a marketing ploy but someone in the in the questions, you know, just asked about, you know, you know, what do they need to to do in order to be seen by board fit or, you know, be a part of an, a program like that? Yeah, I mean, our board leadership center, you know, we, we have a website, 
anybody can can reach out to us. And we're obviously looking for great candidates that uh, could be part of that. You know, I, I also think too, Sasha, about the, the whole concept of just being accountable as leaders. And we, we believe at KPMG that transparency leads to accountability and accountability really leads to progress. And, you know, if I think about my, our own organization, we, we have an 11 person management committee, three are black and five of the 11 are women, but the rest of KPMG doesn't look like that. So, you know, 2% of our partners are black and 6% of our employees are black. That, that's nothing like what America looks like. So, you know, I think a lot of this really comes back to accountability and without accountability, we're not gonna drive real progress moving forward. Well, that was my next question to you. <laughs> it was about accountability. And, um, you know, I think when we were preparing for this and talking about it, you also mentioned tying it back to compensation, right? And so, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So when I took uh, the role as CEO of KPMG on July 1st, and that was right, you know, a month after George Floyd was killed, and we started our own internal strategic effort called Accelerate 2025. You know, we, we looked at diversity, equity, inclusion differently for the first time. We said it has to be driven by strategy, it has to be part of our talent strategy, and it, it cannot be the case that it's, and there's nothing wrong with thinking about it as part of what HR does, but it has to be driven by our business leaders. So we're audit tax and advisory in our organization. And we said the business leaders have to be front and center and my compensation, my performance evaluation, the leaders of our three businesses and our growth and strategy leader, we all have to be held accountable as we move forward. And we set aspirational goals to allow the board of directors to measure our progress going forward. And that's crucially important. You know, we feel like we're not gonna make the progress we want to make unless we're first transparent. And we, we have dealt with that through issuing a, issuing a transparency report, which can be found on our website. And then we deal with continued measurement as we move forward and ensure that the board of directors of KPMG, of which I'm the chair, but the board reminds me every time that I meet with them, and it's really important that I, I am accountable for driving that kind of meaningful change in the organization. I think that's the first time that we've really said those words in a real and meaningful way in our own organization. And I think that's what many organizations have to think about is really driving accountability through linking progress to performance evaluations and compensation moving forward. I, my, my wheels are turning in my head because I'm agreeing. And the other piece that I'm thinking about is, you know, I think there's a comfort almost to that level of accountability, right? It's good to kind of praise folks and, and reward them. Um, and John, I'm actually come to you with this one, but what about those bad apples, right? What about those leaders that um, don't see the benefits of this or purposefully block, you know, diversity efforts? Um, what can C-suite leaders and board members do when not everyone believes that this is an issue. I think it comes down to the things we've talked about already this evening. I think uh, what Exelon does, there's a guy named Bill Von Haney who created the program where not only does he celebrate the good guys at the Art Institute each year in a big elaborate dinner where he gives out trophies to the firms that have the most diverse teams, but then he stops doing business with the law firms, the accounting firms, the other firms that are not showing up with diverse teams. So I think you have to punish those companies that really are not living these values, especially when they have it in their, on their websites and their annual, annual reports, they care about these issues. We're really not making any, any progress. And then of course, finally, you know, the political and civil rights leaders which we touched on earlier, they really have a responsibility. If your congressman calls you, your local senator calls you and tells you you're not living the values of that state or that community, I think it's hard for people to ignore that. And so getting our political leaders and you know, uh, civil rights leaders to have the same kind of intentionality that I mentioned earlier, Harold Washington, Maynard Jackson, Coleman Young, all those great mayors of a prior generation that fought for these things. We sort of have gotten away from it, but again, we're coming back again 
And hopefully we'll just continue to educate more and more leaders of the impact they can have in forcing companies to do the right thing and live their values. Yeah, thank you. So I think that's something we haven't seen to your point in the recent years is that we are not gonna do business with you, right? Unless you do X, Y, and Z, or we see progress. Um, so I appreciate that. So Stephanie, um, you know, when we spoke, we talked about the challenges, right? You're new on a board. Um, you don't want to seem, or you don't want to be tokenized, right? You want to create change. And you, you spoke about having to have a level of savvy in doing that and kind of picking your battles. So talk to us about what that looks like, or at least what you're seeing in that space. Yes, this is coming from the two data sets that I mentioned. One is um, the data that I collected around uh, the when the law around the advancement of women on in boards in California was being enacted. So I collected a set of data around that time. And then now more recently, as there's been this barrage of interest in advancing uh, black leaders to boards. I want to say all this with the caveat that I that, that there is a there's a note in, in the Q&A or in the chat um, around you know the conversation that we're having right now is focusing a lot on on, on black leaders and black board directors. And, and I would say that the conversation in boardrooms and in leadership actually mirrors the conversation that we're having right now. So let me tell you with data what is happening because I think it's very interesting. So as the leader, as the, as the conversation around gender diversity became a, a point of, con of concern on boards, um, the primary beneficiary of that conversation at that time were white women, right? So um, at that point in time, um, that was where the conversation was and that's where the energy was. Now, as some boards became more interested in talking about racial diversity or historically when they were thinking about diversity and they weren't thinking about women, they were just thinking about black people. What's been interesting now is to see how white women and black men are helping to advance the conversation around opening up spots for other people of color. So what I've heard in my interview is, is how white women have helped to bring more black women and black men onto boards and black men are now opening up their, you know, virtual Rolodex of lists of names of for qualified black women who can be on the board. And so that's how the conversation is being advanced. And so now what we're also seeing, particularly as there has been, um, you know, I, I would say amplification of the interests as they should be for people who are Hispanic, Latino and Asian and native, these same groups that are in the minority, if I can sort of you know, rubber stamp that, have been doing all this work. Now, I point that out because that, as we very well know, should not, the onus of you know, making sure that we're advancing diversity and inclusion should not be on just on the people who are in the minority populations, but, but that's kind of what's happening. So that said, the level of savviness that becomes important as, as a board member, if you want to either advance a diversity conversation or just wanna make sure that you can maintain effectiveness or in the eyes of your fellow board members, um, a, a sense of yourself as being effective board member does become about the coalitions and the ally relationships that you're building. So if you do want to bring more Asian and Latino people onto the board, then it was who do you effectively build relationships with who also wants to advance that issue. And what I've learned is a lot of this is not taking place. This relationship building is not taking place in the actual board meetings. It's taking outside. So pre-COVID, you know, things that you would do professionally, people who are getting together socially to just get to know one another on an informal level, learn about each other's passions and families. That's building trust so that when we want to talk about issues about diversity on the board or diversity in the firm, it becomes a lot easier. So that's what I'm learning is the key to being effective as a board member, the key to advancing issues of all different types of groups, whichever one you want to name, is really about your capacity to effectively build relationships with everyone on that board, including the CEO slash lead director. Thank you. And just being mindful of the time, um, so we have five minutes. So I want to ask you all, if there was one or two nuggets, that's my, been my word for this series, uh, with tips or recommendations that you would leave with the audience around increasing or advancing diversity for not just their boards, but their executives, because there's that's that pipeline that we were talking about. 
um, what would it be? So Paul, I'll start with you and then we'll go to John and then Stephanie. Sasha, I would say really seek to understand, listen, and engage when it comes to lived and shared experiences of, of those that are underrepresented. Uh, we certainly have been trying to do that with our Black colleagues and our Black citizens over the course of the last 13 months. But you really have to want to understand the experience to really drive real progress going forward. And, so listening, engaging, having those courageous conversations is really important in my view. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. I would just say a couple things uh, that, you know, uh, Melody Hobson, my co-CEO, um, is a very outspoken leader. Um, maybe some people have seen her TED talk on race. Um, when Sheryl Sandberg wrote Lean In, she said afterwards publicly that she was in partially inspired to write Lean In because she saw Melody lean in on a board they were in together and fight for women and fight for women of color. And she realized that she could be more effective with leaning in than allowing the, uh, the trajectory of the conversations to go away from race and sex. And she became more comfortable making people uncomfortable and how important that is. I would also argue or point to the kind of great conferences that Paul's put on, there are many other good ones around the nation. I think there should be courses of how to get women and people of color comfortable speaking up and speaking out in the boardroom, teaching people again in the spirit of John Lewis, uh, how to make good trouble in boardrooms and have that inspired and show people how to do that effectively. And also help to teach white CEOs how to help create that kind of comfortable culture where those conversations can occur, where the diverse directors can really make a difference and not be quiet and shy, which is often what happens uh, when you're on those early boards. I just made a note, I'm gonna work on that workshop for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Stephanie. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a researcher, so I'm going to talk about the importance of data. I hear it time and time again whenever I'm interviewing executives or board directors. Um, the tables do not seem to turn unless somebody sees it written somewhere um, and has the capacity to interrogate the data. So board directors have felt more passionate um, about this topic of diversity and board diversity and racial justice because they're now looking at the company's data. They're looking to see who's in line for succession and who's not. They're looking at employee engagement scores. They're looking at inclusion metrics. And so by us as academics producing data or in-house um, teams uh, producing data that then go to these powerful actors, um, this is how we begin to make um, traction. The last, I'm cheating a little bit, but the, the, the last point that I wanna make is the value I, I see, my, my whole career so far has been defined by um, my willingness to connect closely with industry and develop close partnerships with people who know much more than I do about corporate America, who also value data and academic insights. I'm very grateful to John that he values academics and he's been willing to partner with me to help me access the data that I need. And so it goes without saying, I wouldn't leave everybody with, you know, I do think that is important that academia and, and corporate America partner more on research that is mutually beneficial. It is not hard to spin out insights for corporate America based on academic research. I do it all the time. Um, and it seems to be something that I would say attracts um, corporate partners to working with me, but it also seems to be something that I think it makes an impact broadly. So you can do both. You do not have to trade off rigorous academic research for practical insights. And I just hope that more people on both the corporate side and the academic side will um, take the plunge and, and engage more. And with that, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, John. This has been an absolutely amazing um, panel. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions in the chat because I was trying to catch up, keep up with that and the Q&A that came in, but I tried to capture as many as we could. Um, thank you for everything and your insights. Um, this recording will be available in a few days, so we'll be able to continue to share this knowledge. And want to again, thank the PhD Project for a partnership um, in this and look forward to our next panel discussion in May. So everyone have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you.